Hey, it's Andrew, and today on the show we have Hugh Slater, the Chief Financial Officer at Travel Perk. In today's episode, we discuss the importance of looking at cohorts when measuring retention, how Hugh goes about measuring a customer's lifetime value, and whether or not word of mouth can be measured. We also talked about the concept of a growth ceiling and how Hugh evaluates opportunities that drive growth to allocate capital to. As usual, I'm excited to hear what you think of this episode, and if you have any feedback, I would love to hear from you. You can email me directly on andrew at churn.fm. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Enjoy the episode. This is churn.fm, the podcast for subscription economy pros. Each week, we hear how the world's fastest growing companies are tackling churn and using retention to fuel their growth. How do you build a habit forming product? We crossed over that magic threshold to negative churn. You need to invest in customer success. It always comes down to, to retention and engagement. Completely bootstrap, profitable and growing. Strategies, tactics and ideas brought together to help your business thrive in the subscription economy. I'm your host, Andrew Michael, and here's today's episode. Hey, Hugh, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? I'm great. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. It was actually a recommendation, as you know, we're chatting before from Sancho, who's actually the VP of Marketing at Hotjar. So thanks a lot, Sancho, for the recommendation. It's great to have you. For the listeners, Hugh is the CFO at Travel Perk. Travel Perk is reinventing business travel with an end-to-end solution that works, which we'll chat about in a bit. And prior to Travel Perk, Hugh was the CFO at Typeform, VP of International Finance and Operations at Box, and the Finance Director for Service Delivery at BT. So my first question for you here is, as the CFO of Travel Perk, what are you accountable for? Like, where do you focus your time today? It's a mixed bag, Andrew. So first and foremost, I'm accountable for the, the financial uh, reporting, I guess. And there's a lot of statutory reporting that goes alongside that. So making sure everything's done uh, as it should be. And that's kind of the, the most fundamental functional part of the role, whether that's getting inf- financial information into internal stakeholders' hands, tell them how the business is going, or whether it's fulfilling our obligations with our statutory reporting. So that's a foundational part of the role. Now, I try and set that up in a way that it doesn't take up a lot of my time. And really where I'm spending a lot of my time is with the exec team and really trying to catalyze action to make sure we're the money as best we can to get the best return and in our case at, at travel Perk, that's a lot about growth because the opportunity in front of us is is enormous so really providing them with the information to catalyze action and then strategizing with the team on where we should be going and which which options we should be taking to get there because the options are infinite uh, and our resources aren't so making good decisions and saying no to a lot of things is very important and really that's where i spend a, a lot of my time Interesting. And I see as well, like obviously I mentioned a few companies that you had before, uh, they're predominantly subscription-based businesses. Is there any reason like uh, as a financial officer, you've chosen to focus on subscription businesses? It's more the, the technology aspect than subscription. The Coming from BT, I spent 10 years at BT, as you, as you said in your intro, and you know, it was a very kind of engineering-focused business. You know, there's copper in the ground providing broadband to all, all the houses in the UK and that wasn't uh, motivating for me I, you know I learned a lot at BT and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that, that I had there but it wasn't motivating for me and moving into technology is much more motivating you know the amount of innovation that happens in technology both on the consumer side and, and the business side i.e., the products that you're delivering uh, for the end user but also on the internal process and the systems that you're using internally, there's just a huge amount of innovation. And, and that's what was interesting for me. So subscription uh, as a service is kind of secondary to the fact that it's technology, uh, a technology-led business. Yeah, that makes total sense. Though the point of like the subscription side of things as well, is there any sort of unique things you like in these types of businesses that from a financial perspective like excite you? Well, I think the the model itself is is interesting, and you know people probably don't think of it as that disruptive 
these days, but you know, when I got into this, into subscriptions, whatever it was, eight years ago, uh, it was still relatively new uh, as a business model. So that in itself, you know, kind of leaning towards my uh, enjoyment of innovation, that was exciting. So getting into a business where the business model itself was a piece of innovation was very exciting. You know, and then there's lots of financial implications of that. You know, you do your month end processes differently, and just the accounting rules are different for subscriptions than they are for other businesses. So that. that that was definitely a side for me that, as I say, leans towards my jo- enjoyment of innovation. Yeah, I definitely see that. I think as well, like it's still in its infancy when you think about it as a business model and uh, we're still going through these learning curves. I think maybe one of the first subscription businesses that started as a subscription business was probably Salesforce in 1999. There were other cases before that, but if you think about it, uh, this sort of model is only really 20 years old, not 21, just getting its driver's license. So I think there's there's a lot of uh, innovation yeah, that's so. still to be done and still uh, hasn't been uncovered yet when it comes to running and operating them. So then bringing into the, the topic of the show, and I'm really interested, I think, as a challenge, because when it comes to churn and retention, this is something that's typically like not thought about in the early days when growth is uh, is immense and growing and it's growth at all costs for the majority of companies. And then until some point they hit the sort of growth ceiling and then they're like, oh shit, uh, we need to turn things around now. We need to figure out like how we can retain more customers. And I think the nature of your role though as well is you're typically not going to be one of the first couple of hires at a startup. So the question is like when you join a company, like first of all, like how do you decide uh, on which company you think is going to be a good fit for you? And uh, what are some of the metrics? Is churn and retention one of those? And then second, when you come into uh, this company, sort of how are you looking at churn and retention and how are you trying to influence it and make a difference for it? Yeah, it's if I try and break that down, so uh, the first part of the question is, you know, what type of company or what stage of company uh, would I join? And, and you're right, you know, CFOs aren't required at the seed stage. Uh, I'm very unlikely to be asked to come and be somebody's co-founder and, and, and try and help out there. So, you know, kind of certainly Series A, kind of late Series A is, is probably where I'd come in and through that scale up uh, phase where product market fits already been achieved, hopefully. And it's really about how you how you're allocating capital really to drive the growth. So. That's certainly more where I'm uh, likely to be found. It's actually what I really enjoy as well. So that's good. And then in terms of metrics, absolutely churn and retention are one of the most important things. Everyone loves to see those, you know, the cohort slides where you see the, each cohort compounding on top of the new cohort and up and to the right it goes, you know, Alice Slack and, and Dropbox and, and the other guys. So it's absolutely something that I look at. In, in, in fact, you know, here at Travel Club, it was, it was the first, even before I joined, it was the first thing that I built uh, when I got access to the data room uh, through my interview process. So, you know, it's fundamentally important to the business. And, and I, you know, as the CFO, really want to understand that before I, before I jump in. So that's, that's really important to me. So you know, once I guess I know that churn and retention is important, then what do I do about it? And, you know, when I join the company, what am I looking at? And it's understanding, you know, I'd spent four years at BT kind of doing internal management consulting and, you know, I did Six Sigma and, you know, a lot of your listeners might roll their eyeballs at this, but kind of following the DMAIC approach, so define, measure, analyze, improve and control. Um, but it's very helpful. So, you know, you come in and define and I've actually seen people do this wrong. You can measure churn a million different ways or measurement retention a million different ways and actually narrowing that scope so you understand what it is you're trying to, to measure, who it is, you know, which geography you're looking at, which geography do you care about, which segment, big businesses, small businesses, or even what's happening by cohort. So really defining that problem. Then measuring it, and again, this isn't, you might expect me to just say it's just pure data, it's not. You know, you know, churn is a misalignment of value, so I want to understand both the qualitative and the quantitative side of what's going on. You know, what, what are people saying about the product when they churn? And then what does the data tell us about it? You know, is it a specific type of customer? Are they not using a certain feature? Is it a particular time in their life cycle? So sort of doing all of that measurement and then analyzing it, right? Diving into to look for trends, really look for the root cause of what's driving it. 
and again that's not something i can do on my own you know i i, I really enjoy and I, I pride myself in working across the whole organization you know working with their heads of customer success or sales or uh, product to really understand that and and with them come up with the, the kind of improvements and then putting in place the controls the kpis to look at it so you know, it's a very standard kind of process and it's not like i come in and write all, all down with a huge project plan but i i do my mind just naturally works like that and i'll work through that kind of process, process. yeah uh, to try and help I realize after I asked the question as well, it's pretty loaded, but I think you did an excellent way of unpacking it and answering step by step. So thanks for that. I think you'd make an excellent host. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you mentioned quite a few things and I want to touch on, on as well. So the first one was when you were going through the hiring process uh, at Travel Perk, one of the first things you put together was sort of a retention analysis when you got access to the data room. What did that entail? What was the steps that you're looking at? What was the actual figures that you were trying to establish from your side? For me, it was, so I didn't know the business at all. I mean, I was a customer actually at the time, but I didn't know the intricacies of the, the travel business. So the analysis I did was relatively high level, but I, I think it stands the test of time. So I'm just, I was just looking at cohorts. So each month, you know, what customers did you acquire? And then I just did account-based retention from that and built out the cohorts. And then what we call GMV, so gross merchandise value retention, like the dollars through the platform from that cohort each month, how did that change? And then you just have two hopefully very pretty charts in front of you. Uh, and from that you can, or I was able to sort of learn a little bit but enough to ask a lot of questions. And, and really that's what the interview process is then about. It's about me understanding more about the business and the behaviors that sit behind those cohorts. Um, yeah. You know, now I've joined, you know, there's a million different ways that we're looking at it, but that one is Obviously. still, when, when, I lo when I lo look in the morning and, and look at my dashboard, that one is still up there. So I'm still looking at the same one. Uh, and I just now drill down on it as I see things. As you see things, yeah. So then, then you predominantly, obviously, from a CFO perspective, but focusing on net MRR retention then. And, and talk us through the cohorts as well. This is something like we talk a little bit about on the show, but we never really go into great detail. So what is the benefits of looking at retention, net MRR retention on a cohort basis? And why should companies be doing it? I mean, there's pros and cons uh, to doing it, but I think it's very powerful because you're not averaging things out. I think there's a big risk in companies when you analyze the data that you just take, you know, essentially you take every cohort's retention curve and then you average it together. And, you know, inevitably you'll end up with a smile curve to begin with because the oldest cohorts are usually the best performing because they're an investor or they're your family or friends. And, you know, so averaging it out can be very misleading. And it also, so that's why I don't average it out. That's why I like the, the cohorts. And it's also an ability to see what's happening in a, obviously in a bit more detail, but by that, I mean, there might be one cohort that's really outperforming or underperforming or halfway through their life cycle, they change behavior. And that's interesting, okay? That gives you a data point to go and dig into because maybe that cohort was made of, you know, in our case, it might've been a startup and the net retention is amazing. Uh, because they're growing okay well that's interesting but that doesn't necessarily mean our product was any better or any worse at that point so it just gives you an extra level of granularity and i'd encourage everyone to do it there's loads of uh, information on the internet to go and read and actually there's a, an article called the eight ball analysis which talks a lot about this uh, and i'd encourage it even comes with the sql uh, queries to, to kind of pull it all together so nice. i definitely encourage people to do it and you know there's tools out there that do it for you as well but it's it's visually pleasing. I know that sounds weird for a, for a CFO as well, but it's, you know, it's a nice chart to look at. Um, yeah. and, and let's have to drive change, which this is all about. You, you know, you do the analysis to drive change. Actually having something that people can engage behind is useful. Yeah, for sure. And I think as well, like the aspect you touched a little bit on is understanding how the different cohorts are performing over time. I think one thing as well gives you good visibility on seasonality and the influences that that has on various yep. cohorts and starting times. Uh, and I think even now in the times, it's quite interesting, obviously in the travel industry, what's uh, happening uh, with some global health scares, but I'm sure like you see that in your numbers as well, starting to influence like depending on what's happening uh, at the time and in the news and able to easily see that in your different cohorts and having an understanding of like how behavior is changing is really important. 
Uh, I'm also interested in the context and sticking with cohorts uh, is looking at LTV uh, and the customer lifetime value and trying to understand from each account or from each user, like how much money are you making from them over time? And I think the problem with LTV is typically it's one of those metrics that is blended and that is an average. Is there anything that you've done or you're doing currently to try and get a better grasp of what the LTV is at the moment? Uh, because obviously this is an influence of uh, churn and retention itself. It's an influence of like the average sale price or the APA. How are you looking at this metric? Is there just no better way than looking at this blended average over time? Yeah, again, very related, very dependent, I guess, on the, on the business. Uh, if it's a bit of a cookie cutter business, then I think LTV is fine. You know, it's like you say, it's an average. And, and if nothing's really changing underneath, then keep it simple and, and use the average. But it is, you know, a lot's written about LTV uh, and CAC. And we need to remember that it's just a return on investment, just a different way of articulating return on investment. So uh, the, the things that we do internally, and actually I've done in, in previous roles, with a lot of help of other people, I might add, certainly, certainly not my genius that, that does these things, but with the support of other people is using the cohort to build out actual, like real LTV. So you know, how much have you actually returned? What was the actual cost of that actual cohort of acquiring that cohort? And then you're just building a payback model. So it's exactly the same analysis as you do for the cohort retention. You just layer on the, the cost of acquiring those customers and then just follow those cohorts through to see, you know, what was the payback period? Did they pay back in eight months, 12 months, 24 months? And then using that, you can go on to, if you want to get slightly more finesse than just doing a simple LTV, you can go on to use some predictive models to say what those, you know, each cohort will look like over time. You know, LTV in its own right is is clearly a uh, is you know if your retention plateaus, then in essence your your lifetime value is infinite, right? So already you can it's very easy to sense that LTV isn't accurate. It's just a a, a simple way of making the the numbers work. And then for me, it's actually doing it by cohort, showing the payback, which is a critical metric or should be a critical metric. You know, it's all about how quickly you're recovering that cash from from the investment and then how much money you make beyond that. So again, very, you know, it's the same Excel sheet. It's not more complicated. You're just dropping in the, the cost to acquire and then you're observing the real payback uh, and hopefully the real profit that you make from those uh, customers. Yeah, I think it's always a very, very, like, it's, it sounds like it's the ideal scenario of having sort of the cohorts understanding what it costs to acquire those customers and then understanding their payback period. Depending on the business, this varies greatly, like the first month you acquire them, and then when you get the first revenue from the customer, if you're a freemium business, it adds another level of complexity. But definitely having that closer view on sort of on a cohort by cohort basis, what did it cost you to acquire them? And then at what point do you actually pay back at the start getting return on that investment over time, I think is also a very great way of looking at it and being able to understand how healthy uh, is your acquisition strategy? Are you acquiring the right customers? Are things improving over time? As opposed to sort of looking at that LTV uh, metric, which could take up to 12 months for it really to start being influenced on some changes that you made. Yeah. Uh, and you only see those impacts gradually, not immediately. Yeah. Cool. So you mentioned something else then as well, Hugh, in terms of like your role and trying to understand and see where resources need to be allocated within a company, within a business. And when it comes to sort of churn and retention specifically, you needed to sync and organize between success and sales and products and understand how resources should be allocated. Uh, and a lot of times I think as well, companies are looking at um, growth and really that becomes the focus. At what point or how do you decide as a CFO of like where you should be allocating resources, whether it should be to, to growth and to try and unlock new channels versus trying to retain customers and uh, working on product initiatives or uh, customer success? And how do you strike a balance between the two? I wish I had a framework uh, that it allowed me to answer this question easily. And the answer is I don't. I think it's... Look, my experience has been in high growth startups and I don't often have the luxury of time. So the honest answer is usually it's the most important thing. It's the most critical thing that happened to be in front of you is the bit that gets the attention. And that works certainly on the, the quantitative side. And by that, I mean, you know, if growth is stalling, clearly, you know, the attention will go there and we'll try and invest more in 
A, understanding it and then B, acting on it. And if retention is the problem and retention could be the problem that's hurting growth, clearly, then, you know, spend more time there and, and analyze it and work with the customer success team and the user research teams to, to really dive into it. So I don't have a good answer that says, you know, over a year, I look at these different things at this uh, particular cadence. It's about always being on top of the data, always being curious about it, never taking anything with, for granted. And then, you know, using that data to kind of direct myself in the conversations. And then from that, hopefully direct the resources, help direct the resources uh, around the business. In, in the right way. I think there is a there is one element of that that I try and, you know, we will have our faults, but I, I try and maybe fail at this more often than I should is I do try and keep one eye on the, the kind of the next growth curve um, or the next growth opportunity. So that might be a new product innovation uh, or it might be, you know, really making a difference on retention. So it's this kind of three horizons growth model and, you know, horizon one, clearly in a high growth startup, you're, you're constantly thinking about it. I do try and keep a, one eye on the horizon two to just think, you know, well, what is going to happen? What happens when we hire every salesperson in Europe? You know, there is a limit to that. So you can't grow any more quickly than that. So what else could we be doing? So, you know, I think it is my job to do that. And it's just, you know, how much time of my time do I spend thinking on the longer term versus the shorter term? And I absolutely don't have a a model that I that I run myself to or a framework. I just try and uh, do the best I can. Yeah. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, like trying to understand at which points different growth channels become saturated. Mm. The, the thing as well is interesting, and I don't know if it's something you've done, maybe a travel perk or a type form, is the concept of doing a growth ceiling. Is this something that you've done? Maybe you want to talk us through it if you have with the listeners so they can get an understanding of what it is and uh, why it's sort of an important moment uh, for any company to realize. Yeah, so and the, the terminology I'm not familiar with, so <clears throat> let me give you my interpretation of that. So both at Typeform and uh, at Travel Perk, I think a fundamental part of the job is to, to do that scenario analysis that says at what point does the growth start to plateau and for what reasons. And that could be the saturation of the channel or it could be the, the retention or the churn that drives that. And that's a very eye-opening a very relatively simple anyway piece of analysis it's easy to think the growth is unlimited but actually it's very easy to prove that it's not or it's very very hard or very expensive to maintain the growth so so i think that that might be what you talk about with the growth ceiling and and it's a hugely yeah. powerful piece of analysis and i would encourage everyone to think about it i mean it took me maybe four hours uh one morning to do it here here and you kind of, you know, I backed into it almost. I was thinking about, you know, what's the triple, triple, double, double, double? You know, you know if we were to achieve that, what sort of resources would we need? You know, what sort of channels could we use to drive that growth? You know, how does retention play into it? So, you know, I started at a very high level model and it doesn't take you long to work out, you know, where the bottlenecks are going to be, where those ceilings are going to be uh, in doing it. And then, you know, have years, you know, to, to plan for it rather than stumbling into it one day. Yeah, and I think it's a really critical thing to do. Like you say, if it's something that takes you four hours and even if it takes you a week uh, to do it, I think a lot of companies in early stages will just see growth and see, okay, things are going really, really well today yeah. without having a clear picture of when that ceiling is going to be hit. And then they go ahead starting to hire as many people as possible and uh, start investing into different resources without having a clear picture of what the growth trajectory looks like for the business. And for some people, that moment is a lot sooner than others. And that's where we tend yeah. to see sort of people losing jobs and companies shutting down because planning was never done or this analysis that's reasonably simple to get done, but just nobody ever spent the time to do it because growth looked too good to be true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is there anything that you've done specifically at Travel Perk uh, when it comes to churn and retention that has been a game changer for the company or maybe even a type form if you want to speak to? Certainly not at, at Travel Perk. We've been blessed with an incredibly good product and amazing seven-star service that really drives you know, exceptional net dollar retention here. So it's not been a focus for me at all since I've been here. In fact, it's a case of you know, how do we make sure we keep investing in those areas to, to make sure we maintain rather than enhance that retention. The type form, again, you know, I certainly don't think I did anything great there, but one of the things I did with a couple of the, the, the exec team there is really 
dive into retention. And you mentioned this before, it's, you know, when you have a freemium model um, versus a standard subscription model, there's a lot of different behaviors um, going on in there. And defining actually where you start measuring retention from is, is a critical point as well. Is it when somebody signs up and then, you know, if you're a freemium product, you will naturally see a huge amount of churn because it's just a tourist coming in, you know, playing around with the product and then churning out versus when they start paying or when they end the pay trial, you know, so, so defining that is, is an important point. And, and one of the things that I partnered with a number of the execs uh, at the Typeform leadership team is trying to unpick this, you know, what is driving that retention curve that we could see, which was very healthy, but, you know, it was a bit of a struggle to understand how we could influence it. And really we took a, a click down and we saw a number of different things. So we did see this kind of lost tourist, you know, somebody signs up and just has a play around and which is fine it's a freemium model you know we should expect that versus somebody who's using the the service for projects you know maybe it's a, a school teacher asking for a survey at the end of the term fine we only expect to see that once every three months or four months versus somebody who has 10 different use cases and they're using it every month so really running that analysis with the data team you know with the head of customer success david apple who, who's amazing working with santa as well on the persona analysis you know really building a team effort behind this and understanding the behaviors that sit behind it because until you understand the behaviors you can't do any influencing so again certainly nothing i can take any credit for frankly but very good team effort and and I, I really believe in that. I said that at the top of the call, that there's very little, I think, any one individual in, in a, a good modern SaaS company can do because the end consumer of the product is enjoying so much about it. They're not just enjoying the the kind of the value, the, the outcome that they're getting from it. They're usually enjoying the experience as well. So, you know, the design aspect of how it works and the service aspect of, you know, speaking to customer care when they have to. So, you know, uh, you probably could find one or two silver bullets, but I think they'd be quite small and, and working cross-functionally and really sort of clicking through all of those different uh, root causes is is very important. And I was very grateful to be working with a great exec team at Typeform to do that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I love the modesty too as well. <laughs> it's excellent. The the thing I think as well is very interesting is what you mentioned now is in terms of, and I think a lot of companies maybe forget is that when people are purchasing a product, so many people just see their product as that end thing that the people play with or where they go into in travel for the case to book a, a trip. But really like in today's day with SaaS, like companies need to be evolving to become product companies where they're not making products. They are a product and every touch point that yeah. they have with their customer is a touch point with their product. So whether it's customer service, whether it's their marketing, uh, creating that unique experience all around their company and not just the specific end results, uh, I think is really, really critical to get right to get sort of that moment where you say with like travel perk, where you're blessed with really, really strong retention, but it's because of all the surrounding aspects to the product and not just the product in today's terms product itself. So next thing I want to ask you was like the question I ask every guest is a hypothetical scenario now that you've joined a new company and uh, you see that churn and retention is not doing great and you've been asked to actually turn things around to head up the, the initiative. What would be some of the things that you would want to do in the first 90 days to try and produce some results for the company? Um, okay, so I guess I would follow the framework framework that I spoke about at the top of the call, there's a, there's a few critical pieces that kind of demaic, uh, you know, define, measure, analyze, uh, improve and control framework. But there's some critical things that I didn't speak about there that I'll, I'll talk about now, which is, first of all, engage people, engage people in the company, respect the past, I guess. It's unlikely that if, if there's a problem that people have never looked at it before. So make sure, respect the past, go and learn everything you can. Uh, there's no point wasting time repeating old mistakes. So go and engage people around the problem, learn from the past and, and really engage them in, you know, we'll do something different this time, but we'll do it together, right? So I think that's that's really important. So that's part of the definition phase is, is building that kind of case, whether it's an emotional case, whether it's uh, the actual business case for, for driving the change. So that's one. I think the if I kind of mentally walk through the process myself, I'd move into the, the measure stage. And as I say, that's a lot of user research. So I'd definitely be speaking to, to customers. And I did the same when I joined Travelberg. You know, just ring up some CFOs, some customers and say, what do they love and what do they hate about the product and really get it from their perspective. 
and also really understand the product. It's very easy, I think, for execs or, you know, somebody maybe in a finance team to think, well, you know, I, I don't have to use the product. So, you know, I don't use it day to day. I don't need to, but you've got to really understand that product. So I think part of the measurement phase for me is really getting into the, into the nuts and bolts and how it works and the different personas and how they use the different product and just generally what the product experience is and the outcomes are. So speak to customers, understand the product and then obviously all of the the data analysis that, that goes with it um, and then after that as I said before it's it's back to the team game right it's bringing that insight to people analyzing it from different perspectives and prioritizing and testing with customers I think you know, and this is where the actually the, the finance role becomes quite tough Clearly, I want to point to something and then be able to, you know, we made this change and then I can see this return on investment. And as you just uh, articulated, that's not always true in the SaaS world today. Like there's a lot of soft kind of belief and emotion that goes around using a product. It's not just the, the hard part of the product. So that makes sometimes for an uncomfortable, you know, investment case, if you like, for me, because there's no tangible outcome or the, the outcome might be improved NPS, maybe. So it's hard. I mean, that part's hard, but you've got to get together as a team and, and really make almost a portfolio of changes, some of which are very tangible and some are less tangible, and then follow it through, you know, measure those impacts and, and really make sure that you've, you've delivered value. So Again, it's, it's formulaic and, you know, it's not for everyone, I understand, but, you know, I'm a CFO and I kind of get to have that, that approach and it's worked for me before. So, so I'm happy to, happy to follow it again. But I guess the key takeaways there are, you know, engage people at the beginning and through the process, everyone, you know, learn from the past, engage everyone, as many people as you can, and understand everything from the customer's perspective to how the product works and then go and collect data. Doing it from an abstract position isn't going to help you at all. Very nice. And again, great job on the summary as well. You're doing my job for me today. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to ask as well, and you mentioned this quite interesting, uh, is the concept as well like of word of mouth. And a lot of times like you have different aspects that you're trying to invest into, but you can never really justify the cost because you can't see an immediate ROI. In the context of uh, word of mouth, and I think obviously in the concept of retention, the longer you retain customers, the more chance you have for them to speak about you and the more chance you have for you to refer your product to your service. In your experience, like what has been the best way to try and measure word of mouth and uh, the ROI that you get from it at maybe a company like Typeform or Travelbook? Uh, this is making me come out in cold sweats, I think, talking about this. We, uh, we, I would say, I struggled with this. Part of this is the 10 years of training, I guess, the kind of functional training I had at BT, which everything had to be tangible. And, you know, when I ended up at Typeform and you know, it was an incredibly viral product and word of mouth is, is fantastic. You know, it's, it's one of the biggest assets the company has, and that's because it's a product-led company. It became very hard for me to, you know, to point uh, these direct correlations between things. And we spent a lot of time with the data team and uh, cross-functional team with marketing trying to unpick this and build attribution models. And, and the reality was, you know, we spent maybe six months, you know, a small group of us trying to, to do this. And really, we didn't get a much better answer at the end than we had at the beginning. Now, I'm sure they've improved that dramatically since I've left. But one of the learnings I took from that is sometimes you have to accept it. It depends very much on the product. You need to understand, you know, should you accept it or not? Or is it just we haven't got the right tracking in place or, or something like that? But there are products out there that are inherently viral. And you just have to be at peace with it. And I think if you, you focus on what works, you know, focus on building that good product, making sure you're delivering a, you know, the functional value that the, the user wants, but also the experience that comes with it. And then word of mouth is like a, a very important, but it's from a financial perspective, it's onus on top. If I can make the LTV to CAC work on the directly attributable stuff, then the word of mouth is, is a very nice sweetener on top. And then you can just monitor it. You know, is it changing over time? Should we start to get worried? But, you know, I unfortunately don't have a good answer. I, I don't have the answer. And I promise you, I'm actually sweating while we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it is an uncomfortable thing. And it's very sort of elusive to try and understand the influences because a lot of the times, like when we think about making, running experiments and something actually at Hotchar we, we've talking about recently is, uh, if you're looking at your pricing and packaging and you say, okay, the product's improved quite a bit now, it's time to look at a, at a price increase. 
it's difficult to try and then understand, okay, if we increase our prices, how is this going to impact conversions? And then how does the impact on conversions impact word of mouth? And then how does that look at the long term? Because I think more often than not, people might look at the short term gains and say, okay, yeah. if we increase prices, then uh, that's going to increase our ASP by X and uh, ARPA by Y. But what they're not really looking at is like specifically in more viral nature businesses, how big of an impact does that have on word of mouth and uh, on growth overall? It's critical. And I think one of the Jason Lemkin from Sasta came across a blog post where he mentioned sort of that ultimately like almost all software companies end up getting about 80% or so of their customers from existing customers. So once they hit scale, either through referrals or from brand or from word of mouth, uh, and typically in the early stage, it's maybe around 40% is coming mm. then. And I think this does stand true, at least for us at Hotjar, we see on average around 40% of growth coming just from word of mouth or hearing from a colleague or used it before. Yep. So it definitely is, is an interesting topic in the concept of retention as well to not only just be thinking about, okay, like how do we keep customers, but how does keeping customers impact growth overall and this word of mouth? Yep. Well, pleasure having you on the show today. I really, really appreciate your time. Is there anything you want to leave the listeners with uh, before we close off for today? I think the only thing we didn't touch on that I believe is very critical for, for retention is this essence of being part of an ecosystem. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, integrated with ERPs or you know, HR systems so that you don't just become one feature that's easily replaceable when a better uh, feature comes along. And, you know, you can see this in the data. We saw it at Typeform. We can see it at Travel Perk, at Box. It was the same. I know at Vend, it was the same. So there's, there's huge value in being part of the overall ecosystem so that you're not just, A, a standalone service, or you run the risk of just being shelfware, or, you know, you're just in one small part of the, the company. So I think it's a huge uh, asset, and you see more and more people doing it. I think it's probably Salesforce, in fact, that that, that kind of led this way of working. So I think that's a huge thing to consider. And, and if people are starting that journey, definitely get the right tracking in place because you'll be able to see the uplift very visibly when you see people integrating your product to, to other solutions they use. Yeah, absolutely. You want to be where your customers are. And I think so often not to be forget about this and we look at our products and it's our product, but at the end of the day, you're serving your customers. And if your customers are not in your product, you want to be where they are. So definitely that's come up in the podcast a couple of times as well. We've specifically spoken about integrations more recently. We had an episode with the CEO of Crossbeam where we discussed this. We've actually looking at now, how do you take advantage of partnerships uh, more effectively? Well, it's been a pleasure again, like I said, having you today, Hugh. I really, really appreciate the time and I wish you best of luck now in this new year and your new journey at Travel Perk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. And that's a wrap for the show today with me, Andrew Michael. I really hope you enjoyed it and you're able to pull out something valuable for your business. To keep up to date with Churn.fm and be notified about new episodes, blog posts, and more, subscribe to our mailing list by visiting churn.fm. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. And you can provide your blunt, direct feedback by sending it to andrew at churn.fm. Lastly, but most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it and leave a review as it really helps get the word out and grow the community. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.